I'm just going to introduce Louise. I met Louise in the kitchen um, on the fourth floor at Wasps about nine months ago. And just after chatting a bit, we realised that we'd graduated from the, the art call at Duncan Johnston at the same time. And, uh, and the more we chatted, kind of people we knew and so on, and I'd bought um, some art uh, of a friend of hers at our degree show. Um, yeah, so it was just good to get to get to know her and realise that we knew each other. And then the Wasps Open Studios were all were I don't know it was about nine months ago. We we're trying to work work that out. It was certainly before we'd started Nomas. And I remember seeing Louise's work there for the first time and really liking it. The work in particular that's in the space. And um, so Owen and I, when we were sort of selecting artists to to show in in the space, um, Louise's work came to mind. Um, and so Owen and I met her and we chatted and just the, the nature of our chat and what we're talking about the, of kind of commonality between us as people or artists as well um, or in general and the, the, I suppose the vision of Nomas, um, we felt Louise's ideas and our work really fitted in. So it's, you know, we're really pleased um, to have that you've you know, been willing to show with us. Um, and as I say, the work, the work in the space looks great as well. So I'll just introduce Louise formally. Um, this, uh, Louise is a visual artist, a creative facilitator, and a graduate of the Art College. She's currently an artist in residence with Angus Council and has completed public art commissions for Dundee City Council, Angus Council, and being commissioned to participate in uh, the school design creative engagement programmes by Ginkgo Projects. Is that how you say that? Yeah and Angus Council. Louise lectures on the BA Honours Contemporary Art Practice Programmes at the University West of Scotland, uh, City of Glasgow College, and is one of two co-founders of Research and Participatory Artist Network, Trigger. Louise is president of the SSA, the Society of Scottish Artists, uh, one of the oldest and, influen most, uh, and influential exhibiting societies in the UK. Um, at the time of getting to know Louise, she, and we met her, and she was really busy um, with the SSA stuff, and I was just really impressed by um, just kind of how she was balancing all these different projects in life. And then I found that she does it voluntary, um, and I was even more impressed just the amount of work that she puts into that with the SSA, amongst all these other things. Uh, she's won several major awards and has exhi been has exhibited widely in the UK and abroad, including exhibitions in London, Slovakia, Bulgaria, and Spain. Um, where was your work recently stolen from? Bulgaria, Bulgaria yeah. Maybe you can speak a bit more about that. Um, Louise has worked in several major has work in several major collections, including the Mirror Group in London, Dundee City Council, and Fife Regional Arts. Um, so, in the statement that Louise wrote for for this work, I don't know if you saw it on our website, but I'm just going to read it again. An artist works through many processes and experimental pathways that lead to both discoveries and creative cul-de-sacs. This sometimes tangential ex exploration asks questions of what you do, why you do it, and who you are as an artist and, per and a person. And this is the conversation that we were having at the time around these questions. The work that forms in the eye of the needle allows me, this is Louise speaking, to compose the image using the smallest of points or dots that react to and work within selected images or reproductions that have struck a chord in some way. They in turn transfer my response to the reproduction and subvert or erase the original image into a palm and palm, <laughs> palm and cest <laughs> of something curious and other. Um, yeah, I have to confess, I had to look that word up, mm -hmm. but um, it's, it, it really just, it, I'm not, maybe Louise will explain what that word means later, but it really, because I'm not going to, I'm not going to, um, yeah, I'll give you the chance to look it up after if you want. Um, but it just really describes what's going on in Louise's work. So, it's, it, yeah, and I just thought, oh, it's great to use a word like that um, for describing it, even if I don't know how to say it. Um, yeah, so once, once Louise is finished speaking, um, there's just, We've done this um, at the end of, of each of the talks. There's just an opportunity for people to ask questions. Uh, and we've had, we're usually having to really kind of say, we've got to go or the McManus are going to kick us out. We've had some lively conversations and discussions. So please welcome Louise. I was going to use that plectrum and just stand and look stately. <laughs> Where do you want this one to be then, Owen? 
A bit the Irish. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Hi everyone. <laughs> Tell you what, I don't know who Louise Rich is, but she sounds brilliant. <laughs> you should get her to come and talk. She's great. That's okay. Come on, Ishbel. <laughs> so, um, gosh, there's quite a lot of people here, and I was part hoping that maybe there would just be two. So then I wouldn't completely embarrass myself in front of just two people and it'd be all right and nobody would know anything about it. And at the same time I thought, if I'm going to play to an empty house, um, that's going to be awful. And I've played some gigs in my time, but I don't want to play to an empty house. So thank you all for coming very much and supporting me. Um, I wrote some notes. Um, never can't read the notes. But I quite enjoyed writing the notes. <laughs> so that probably says quite a lot about the process of how I go about doing things. So rather than me being terribly formal about the talk. I didn't want to come in and give a speech and an oration about who I am and what I do and sell who I am to you. I just wanted to use as an opportunity to work through visually the processes of what I do and how my mind jumps back and forth between stimulus and catalyst and thought processes and then have to um, come back to it again and various bits and pieces of, of craziness that go on in my brain at any one time. Um, as Kelly has mentioned, um, yeah, I'm quite busy a lot of the time and it, it occurs to me, I was speaking to my mother about this last week and as a child I was always a very, very busy child. I don't seem to be able to not be busy and those of you who know me know that that's not always to my benefit but I like to be involved, I get excited about things, I get stimulated by things, I find it very hard to switch off visually from getting ideas to want to make and as I said in my statement that Kelly so nicely said was uh, that um, it's the artistic itch that you need to scratch every so often and it feels you can almost feel that in your hand that you need to make that mark or make that stitch or throw something around or whatever it is that you do um, but I've spent years trying to marry two different sides to my personality and I've realized that I don't really need to do that because I think you just are that way whatever you do so I've put together a whole series of stuff and we'll just go through it one by one. This is the work as it currently is outside um, Ward Road. However many steps away was it, Kelly? Bless you. Okay. So that's me. Um, and Andy was an assistant today that I put that in as, a, as a, a, a sort of statement of what I am in my studio with the work, all the things that go on and puts me in the context of being a, an artist that works in wasps and Dundee as well as the many other hats that I, I have on from time to time, um, just to put you where I work. Um, this is one of the images that's along the road, that way. This is called Food Q, um, and it was taken from a Financial Times of about a month ago or so, and I'll explain the provenance of where that actually comes from better once I, I sort of backtrack on that, but just to give you a couple of images that are in the windows down the road. Um, and these are about, about eight inches in diameter, so not huge things. And that's the second one. I think that's on some of your chairs. Um, and that one's called um, Corrosion Cast. Imagine me remembering the titles of my own work, which I may blank at a certain point. This is Corrosion Cast, so I'm not going to say too much more about that at the moment. I'll come back to it. Um, but those are two of the images that are down the road. This is where it all comes from in terms of the work that's on at, in the Eye of the Needle at this very point in time now. My good friend and colleague there, Janet at the front, will understand what this picture is. This is Killing Time, which was in DCA in, I think, 2007. I think that would be right. Um, and this is not long after um, my husband and I and the boys came back to live in the East Coast from being over on the West Coast and being back and forth. And um, young children taking time out to be a mother, just be a parent, try and keep things just ticked up and along. And I was desperate to just claw back some of that creative life. I'm also very involved in theatre and I've been involved in drama since I was tiny. So I've always had another bit of a split personality going on. Um, the opportunity to come up for, for Killing Fact, it might have been Pat Steele that even saw the advert for us. It's all coming from you. Um, to go along, in addition for this, this event that was happening now, it's with the um, theatre group, experimental theatre group, Suspect Culture, the Graham Eater and artist, visual artist, and all-round sort of visual guy, Graham Fagan. And they were putting together this um, theatrical, visual art, installation, filmic, performance-type three-month installation. 
Um, I won't go into masses of detail about what that was, but basically they additioned about, I think, 12 of us, would be 8 or 12, I can't remember now, um, to inhabit these sets. Now, I don't know if anybody here went to see Killing Time, you may not have been there, but we basically inhabited various sets that were taken from famous plays. So there was Look Back in Anger, there was The Cherry Orchard, there were very different things involved in. And I was in this particular one, so you can just see me there, sitting at table with Sean from DCE, and there's Ashley, my daughter, and Oren, who I worked with, and this is Paul, who played this assassin character. Now, his role in this um, event was to come through various parts of the film. It can go through sets and come through sets and come back in. It was all very involved. Um, so you came through one set, if you like, which was the film of the entire story. Then you came through to find another five sets, and at various points throughout the three-month run, there would be one or two actors sitting in situ. You weren't allowed to interact with the audience in any shape or form. You were there like you were in a film, which is interesting. When you've got people coming up and asking you things and wanting to converse with you and having a chat with you, or school groups coming out and going, eh, she's not speaking, trying to poke and prod you. Um, you cannot react in any way. So it's a real, a, real, a real test for four hours at a time not to interact with anybody in front of you. But we all had a task to do. And my task was to do a needlepoint because that was befitting my station in the play and so I was given just a couple of embroidery hoops and some vague materials and a couple of needles in a little pack and that's what I got. So that was my job was to sit and do some needlepoint through the course of this um, run. So at one point um, I ran out of materials, I had about three years left of my slot, I thought I can't, I'll go completely nuts if there's nobody in this room and I've got nothing to do, I was starting to sort of get a bit itchy for stuff. And Sean's job was to read the Financial Times. As a wee girl, I loved the Financial Times because it had that lovely pink tone to the newspaper. It always seemed very interesting and, and kind of fabulous when I was little. Um, so I thought, oh, I'll just take a bit off Sean's Financial Times and we'll put that in the embroidery room and see we'll have a play around with it. And that's where it all started because suddenly it no longer became just about me trying to transpose elements of my own paintings into these, it was to make something else out of it. So I've got a slide. That was the first thing that I made before I ran out of the materials. So what, what's happening there, it's, got, it's quite fetal when I see it from that. Wow, it's really fetal when I look on here. Um, but I think I was trying to, yeah, I was trying to very literally transfer what I would do as a painter through stitching, through bits of material and, and layering it up as a, as a sort of collaged area. And so it was, it was quite a sort of straightforward thing to do and I was just feeling my way through it and having a bit of a laugh with it. It wasn't meant to be anything, it was just a bit of a process. Um, so the next one came along, which was more about the line. I started to get interested in the line of the thread and not worrying too much about layering things on top of it. It became something else. And at this point, um, I was then starting to think about actually working out how I make a painting and the kind of shapes that I use when I'm painting and, and motifs that I've gone through years and years and years and years of um, making pieces of work that have been trolled from foreign travel, things I've experienced, things I've looked at and things I've kind of soaked in um, over the years. So that's a, a transition. That was the first one that I made from the newsprint. So that's the very, 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 very first one. Um, I still go back to that one, it's still one of my favourite ones because it's a kind of poetic quality of that just being about the clouds and being quite dreamy, it's quite thoughtful. Um, but I loved the idea of me starting to stitch. And actually, when I look at it now, the stitching is quite crude in comparison to some other things I was doing, but I think that's, that's okay. It became this drawing process of coming through the clouds and coming through the drawing that was already there as part of that newspaper image. So that was the very, very first one. That was the next one but I started to think more again about, uh, about collage and bits back into it again. And um, it got a bit more colourful. Another one. And the thing about this stuff is, is when I'm a painter, um, I'm not undisciplined, but there's a real energetic, gestural, physical quality that I get involved in. There's a lot of music, there's a lot of movement, there's a lot of dancing, there's a lot of mucking around, there's a lot of chucking. Um, not, it's not an arbitrary process, it's very clear, it's very definite what I go through, but there's a very physical activity. This was having to rein me right down to this tiny, tiny, slightly um, obsessive mark-making quality. I was having to control it. It's incredibly delicate working in newsprint. Even just stretching it onto an embroidery hoop is quite precarious. Um, and it became something entirely different as a discipline for me. And I had four hours each day to just sit and, and do that. So it became very meditative. Is that the right word? Meditative? meditative process about how I made the marks and how I then responded to that particular image. Um, 
this one again, this became less about um, adding too much to it, it became much more simplified. And I think you can just see in the top corner, I'm starting to make pattern with the stitches and the marks. It's more about the pouncing, which I'll describe that in a moment, what that is. Um, this is another one. So I've then started to play more with the shape and I'm starting to compose the image. And then we put this against a window to photograph and realise that actually there's this beautiful light quality coming through the drawing. So you've got this surface that's just completely two-dimensional that you look at and, and that's a nice image and it's got a bit of stitch and it's got a bit of colour and a bit of collage. As soon as you put light through it, it becomes an entirely different kind of drawing all over again. That was fascinating. Um, so you were then drawing with lights rather than just drawing with the, the thread of the mark. So that was a bit of a, a watershed moment, I suppose we could say. Watershed, boys, don't say it. Um, so, at this point, I'm trawling away in the spare room in our house at this point, because we not long moved to Brody Ferry. Rudy over there was only one, so I didn't have a proper studio at was at this point. And I'm still the painter, so I've got the head on that's, that's doing all this stuff, and I've got the painter's head on that's trying to do all that stuff. So I was trying to find a way to marry those things together. Not sure it's a natural fit, but I think I was trying to just do that. And you're coming out of one way of working into another way of working. It's, it's, um, it's an interesting road that you're travelling there. Um, and that was one of the first things I did. It's only a tiny little painting, but it's got newsprint in it, pasted onto it this time, and then punched the holes through it, and there's stitching on top of it, and then there's another layer on top of it. So these are the sort of prototypes, I suppose, for the things that I'm working on. One on the right-hand side is just a little um, enlargement of that. You can just see the stitching coming through on that, and there's also images that are then printed out onto acetates that have been stitched into it as well. Here's another one. There's some stitching down the middle. Um, just that idea of, of putting two images together and splitting the canvas. It's another little thing. It looks huge, but it's only that size. It's tiny. Um, and another one. Colour's really strong, actually. But yeah, there's layers, layers upon layers upon layers of newsprint that's been pasted and painted into that particular image. This is getting a bit bigger. Um, same process, but this time I'm scratching in to make the dots. So it becomes a bit of a dot obsession, which having spotty tights on is probably not that much of a surprise, really. Um, always a bit of an obsession. It's that mark and repetition. Um, and here, I'm jumping forward a little bit. Here's some little glass birds um, that I brought back from Slovakia. And the reason why I'm putting that into this just now is that I'm transposing the work to an exhibition that I was invited to exhibit in what will be nearly three years ago now in Slovakia as part of an SSA exchange. And it's an opportunity to just, just to describe what the SSA is for those who don't know what it is. Um, the Society of Scottish Artists is 120 year old. It's a huge institution and it's very um, forward thinking in its way to, to deal with artists. It's about artists working with other artists for artists. It's got no other agenda other than a collective. It's a, it's a very democratic, um, honest society. Um, and I've been part of that organisation on and off for years um, and I came back on to council about five years ago, nearly six years ago now. Um, and at this particular point I was vice president in the society, so we were all invited to go and we got packed off and we went to Slovakia. And that's, that's become a, one of those seminal moments in your life where a lot of things happen because of that, because we went to that place and we had an experience that we don't often get to have as artists in this country. Um, and it was to just be absolutely accepted. As an artist, you were completely valued. We didn't have to put prices on walls. We weren't vetted in that sort of way. It was just a lovely, carefree, um, privileged position to be in for a week. And we don't often get that. It's not because artists are dead special, that we should be special. It's just that it was very nice as an artist not to have to constantly fight against you people thinking you're one thing or another. And you do deal with that a lot as an artist. There's a lot of assumptions about what you do. So. Um, these are the little birds that I brought back with me. So I brought back lots of ideas about who I was, what I did. The work that I sent out there um, was this work. I had four of these. Now these, this was the first time ever in my life that I'd been in an exhibition with other people where the work wasn't painting. So as an artist who's been known as a painter and quite a purist painter in that sense, it's quite daunting because suddenly I had four pieces of work on a wall that were not paintings and I was no longer a painter. It was a weird thing. And the people there didn't know me as anything other than making that kind of work. So I was trying to own that particular set of work and work out what was behind that and find the other layers of what goes on to making that sort of work. So there's, there's the boys drawing daggers at each other. I did have an interesting conversation with the um, 
the then British consulate who was there who just thought it was marvellous that they were up on the wall stage. <laughs> I had lunch with them yesterday. <laughs> um, he didn't quite get the irony of what was going on. But this is called the onlookers. So it's just these two big beasts that have been stitched into. Um, that's a little close-up just of um, how I'm then starting to change the way I make the work, I think, by this point. This point, I'm not really looking at the light coming through. I'm still thinking of them as two-dimensional works on a wall because we didn't know what we were going to go and hang next to. We didn't know how that was going to work. And part of being an artist is... Um, what did you say this morning, Andy? The ritual of presentation is how you present your work. How do you get it on the wall? How are you going to do that? How is it going to look like? How do you want to sell it in that way? Um, and that, that was part of it. How, gonna, how, how to put these things on the wall? They're just paper. I didn't make them with any intent to exhibit. I just, I just made them. So how am I going to do that now? How's, how's that going to work? So um, these are some of the images that took over. These are slightly bigger. These are about 10 inch diameter. That's a wee close up of that one. You can just see on the right hand side, there's two wee figures. That's actually a wee door that opens and there's a wee figure that's doing that way. But it wouldn't fold back to let me see that. But if you can look at the clouds, see the cloud above, you can just start to see I'm becoming more interested in the drawing and less worried about stitch. So it's starting to become less about stitch, really. It's more about the fact that it's a drawing process. Um, and there's another one. A bit more collage this time, with the big red bus in the middle. And this is the last one. This is called statistical bunting. For those that know me know I've got an obsession with bunting. So there had to be something with bunting in it. And these were all statistics um, in the economy. And it's, just, it's an odd thing, because I'm making bits of work out of a, a newspaper that's renowned for its, its, its financial times. It's about money, it's about business, commerce. Um, so you're doing something, something slightly different with how that's perceived to be. That's how I chose to exhibit them there. So they were strung up on silk scarves. Um, and I had two that were on plinths. Um, and it worked really well, but it's still very, very much a two-dimensional, I'm looking at that, so I, that's the way it has to work. Um, and at that point I was thinking, these would be great if these were light boxes and you could see through them, you can have a look at them, you can see the light coming through. So this is still percolating. So if I go back to the birds, the birds are what's me taking all of that back about how I'm going to do that next, what do I take next from that. Um, this here, this is where it all comes from in terms of the technique. Because you do stuff as an artist, and you don't always know where it comes from. You're assuming you're the first to do it ever, because you're totally unique. And actually, you never really are, because most of the stuff that you do has been touched on at some point in the past, or as a process somebody else has found. There's always many, many hundreds of thousands of strains of people all making work, and all you can do is, is bring your own uniqueness to it, and that's what makes it different. But I kept thinking, where's this, where's this technique coming before? And I came across it by chance in a book, um, about pouncing. Put your hands up if you heard of pouncing. I hadn't heard of pouncing. Well done, see textile lady, she'll know about pouncing. Um, but pouncing's a technique for transferring an image onto another surface. It's a form of tracing, it's a form of drawing. Traditionally, if you go back into the sort of 12th and 1300s and beyond that, it was used to transfer big drawings onto walls for artists to make frescoes with. Also used by the old master to do proprietary sketches. They can scale up, they can do lots of different things with it. And they just put little pricks, that's the bottom right hand corner, it's a pouncing tool. Put the pricks through the paper, and then they would have a little sort of ball of either, either charcoal or ground down pigment of some kind in a muslin bag. And basically they would just um, sort of dust that on it and it would leave this tiny little drawing in the back of it, which then fades away once the painting comes on top of it. And it's a beautiful idea about that delicate, delicate drawing being this beginning of it. So it started to, to resonate with how I was making the work and why it was, why it was interesting and putting it into the context of a, a process that's been going on for a long, 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 long time. Um, and that's interesting as an artist to think about how you fit in, because you're always wondering about where you fit into things. Do I fit in? Do I not fit in? What, what's important about that? Is that pointless? Or has somebody done that before? Or is there room for me to do that as well? Um, this is an image on the top, and I think the one on the right hand side, what this guy used to do, and a lot of them used to do it, they would have a painting or a drawing that was successful, and somebody might sell, they would take a trace of it, and then they would use that to pounce, and they would make lots and lots of copies of the trace, fill them in, and sell them as originals. So in the 1500s, this was already a way of copying and sort of reappropriating your own image to sell on and be something else. So that was curious for me because what I'm doing is pinching images from the Financial Times, making them into something else and turning that into a different thing. So there's, there's a whole lot of resonance about that, about the way I make work. 
Um, so I quite like that thing. They call it um, counterproofing, which is interesting. You're pinching your own work and selling it. And they'll even go down into the, even giving each one just a tiny little pencil mark and to make it look um, like it's a one-off drawing. So I like that. And these are um, Holbein, the younger, uh, sketches that have been created with, with a pounds to technique. So they're really beautiful drawings. And I, quite a lot of the images that I've used are, are um, portrait images or faces because they just have this quality to them that work really, really well when I'm doing stuff. But they're beautiful drawings and they're created entirely from pouncing. Um, and they also have been using textiles. Maybe that's where you're getting it from, Carly, is using textile reproduction to move patterns onto different surfaces, to create other drawings. There's one down below is the tracing. So it's a fascinating subject matter. So it's not a technique that I've just sort of happened upon, sadly. I have no copyright on that. But it's, it's lovely that you can place yourself in a long line of technique. And it's used in many, many ways today. Any form of tracing is. So I'm glad I spelled that right because I didn't spell check it. And I was thinking that I would reply to it. So, at that point you get to, you start to, to absorb um, those contexts and you think, okay, so where does that come from? How does that relate to what I did 10 years ago or 20 years ago? It's something that I do as an artist, but maybe people don't, but I do. I'm always thinking, where does that come from? So what did I do 20 years ago that made sense for now? Or, or how does that work for me? Um, and this, this is a monoprint. Um, I sound surprised. It is. That's a monoprint. <laughs> surprised myself there. From... Oh, must, it must be about 18 or 19 years ago, Andy and I made a trip to Israel. And we went to Bethlehem to the Church of the Nativity. And it was a really powerful, profound experience, actually. And I'm, I'm not religious, I'll, I'll declare that. But it had a very big impact on me, that particular um, site. It, just, it was so alive with energy, not all good energy. It was a tense, difficult place, all of Jerusalem, Bethlehem. And it was, it was God, it was jumping. Um, and actually, the day we were there, they'd invaded Haifa, I think, at that point. So, yeah, it was jumping. It was a lot of really tense people. But I came back and did a series of monoprints based around the Church of the Nativity. And I realised that, although I'm a painter, <coughs> bless you, although I use big brushes and my hands and sponges and everything else, I, I like the drawing of it. I'm drawing with the colour. I draw with the mark. I draw with the texture. And I've always enjoyed lines. So these, these, these had a resonance for me in my own we are making marks. So I thought I would show that one, and I don't think anybody here has probably seen those, actually. You have now. And that's another one, also from the Church of the Nativity, because they had these beautiful big um, incense balls that were hanging from lovely strings. It was like just, just gorgeous sort of theatrical bunting all over this giant nativity, Church of the Nativity, and they had um, old frescoes and old wall paintings that were just in archways and bits that I'd eroded and bits that come away, bits that faded and come back and it was beautiful. It's like a gorgeous big drawing but three-dimensional. It was lovely. Um, and this, this is on perspex, mirrored coated perspex. So it made me think of, I've always had a bit of an obsession with perspex, coloured plastics, coloured glass. That's gone right back to when I was tiny, I was fascinated by coloured glass and coloured perspex. Um, one of my earliest memories is my dad bringing home a fluorescent orange clipboard, which I just used to sit for hours and look at the edge. It was always like the precious thing, <laughs> just stroke it. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm there, I'm still doing the same thing, so I'm still coming back to this idea of multi-surfaces that I use in what um, I'm creating. So this is about applying something two-dimensionally onto something that also reflects you back. So when you're looking at it, you're seeing yourself looking at it as well, and people don't realise until they go, that's me looking at it. So there's a painted layer on top of another painted layer sandwiched in between. And they're quite big. It's, it's yeah, they're about four feet by three feet. Um, and this one's purely on perspex. That's why there's a slight wobbly bit in the middle there, just because it's um, not flat against the wall. So they were created for an exhibition in Glasgow many, many years ago. Um, and that's purely on perspex. And it made me think about how I would like to do that again. And I am. But I'll tell you that in a minute. So I've got that there. So I'm coming on to this, which is a series of what they did for the Meffin um, galleries last year. And by this time, I'm becoming less worried about using thread particularly. I still am, but I'm not making that the be-all and end-all of what I'm doing. I'm becoming more and more interested in the drawing. And I was really clear that I wanted these, this series of work to, to be projected from the wall and have the light come, because it's the light that's, that's um, allowing the drawing to breathe. That's what's really doing the drawing for it. Um, so I had to find a way to present that. How do you, how was I going to do that? Um, and I found these 
That's the one that was stolen in Bulgaria, just in case you didn't know. I know, fingers through, everything. Um, however, you know, it's something quite tragic about our pose, which fits with the Bulgarian, you know. Anyway, so these, these um, little frames here, which is what you see along the road, they're actually what you would use, and Kali will recognise this, for holding it in your knees when you actually are stitching. So it's a way to hold the loop in order for you to make your, your embroidery, whatever you're going to do with it. So I thought it was interesting to then use that as the way of display also. So again, you're appropriating that into a completely different application. So, and they work really well. It's like little footprints on the wall. And they have a rhythm about how they're sighted and they can be altered and projected. And so they start to feel like little heads that are going back and forth. Um, <coughs> that's a detail from one of them. So they still work superficially, um, but they do come alive when that light's behind them. And that's when it gets interesting. This is Gary. Who knows Gary? You know Gary. <laughs> That's, that one there you're seeing there is actually along the road as well. That's called Book Group. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just nice to get somebody to, well, it's nice to see somebody looking at them apart from anything else. But you have to work a bit harder with them. They're not going to present themselves to you. You don't need to go la 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 la. You have to really come up close to it and you have to see the layers. So it's about pe people bringing them right into um, the tiny detail because sometimes I pick out writing on it as well and tiny things, and it's nice to come in really close and just get a sense of that. There's a grouping of three of them, a <laughs> grouping of two of them. You can see how you then start to think, oh, now I'm seeing quite a lot of the image that's on the other side coming through that. So that's changing the image again. So you're looking at, you're, you're looking at something that way, that way, and that way, all at the same time. It's like a Vulcan mind melt, but that's what you're doing. Um, so in between this, Hiya. Hi, Volker, come on in. You, you have your travel, you've got family, you have jobs, you have work. We go up to North Hughes a lot on holiday and um, I became quite fascinated with maps and passing places and signs and roads and maps and various other things. And I thought they were quite interesting little metaphors for how as an artist you have to use passing places in your process because sometimes you have to sort of take a bit of a size step and let something else come through because that's more important or that's more urgent or you think, ooh, I'd really like to do that, I want to have a go at that, let's just do that for a while. So you get off in one direction or somebody says, did you know you could do da la la you go, oh, I want to give that a go. You're always going, oh, that'd be dead exciting, let's do that. And, you know, I've just put the wee otter in there because sometimes you get a bit distracted and there's wee things that can get in your way. <laughs> and you've got to be careful. These are all from North Used. So, having said that, this piece of work here is 100 cubes, not cubes, squares that size. Um, Again, the idea of thread, because I wasn't using thread so much in the pounced pieces. I can call them that now, because I know what that means. Um, rather than just the stitch pieces, is that I wanted to still work with the line and the colour and the idea of them with a cut. I'm not going to stitch with the thread, I'm going to wrap it, I'm going to do something else with it. So I took, I took them all uh, to use with me in a big box in the book, which if you know the size of our car is an interesting notion, actually going to North use with the wellies and the wetsuits and everything else that goes up there. And I took that with me and I sat on the beach for the holiday, wrapping um, three or four or five each day. And I do have an idea in my head that I'd like to have maybe like a thousand of these. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger because they reflect the thought process and they reflect, because you're drawing with that all the time. You put another layer on and that gets drawn around that way. And it's, it's another way to draw in my head. And there we go, this is a bigger one which was about that size. Um, and it's just an interesting thought, and I've, I've kind of put that in a passing place just now, but I think it's important to show you just another way of um, how I make the work and why that's important, because I'll come back to that. It's just canvas. It's a canvas, it's a block canvas that's painted and primed and ready to go. So there's a painted process through that as well, and, and then you start to respond to that. I'm doing that a lot. I do that a lot. Um, the discs. You can see there's a disc thing going on. And it's funny, I was at the art school this year, I think there's discs everywhere. And I went to say, but I've been doing that for years. No, I don't have copied out in discs. Um, and people have been painting circles, it's okay. Um, but I, I realised that you, you, somehow you tap into this weird zeitgeist that goes on about you know, shapes and materials, and suddenly you find that people are, I don't know where that comes from, but there's just this collective response to shape at any one time, or a thing, or a metaphor, or a way of working, or a technique, or whatever it is. It was cupcakes for a few years, and now it's this, there's a disc thing. Or maybe I'm just picking up on it. You know, when I was pregnant, I thought everyone was pregnant. I'd never noticed how many people were pregnant at any one time. I don't know. But there's a disc thing. And it's also 
I harken back to the embroidery hoops. So it's a way to try and think, OK, if I can't paint that way and I can't stitch onto that, then I'm going to use the format. So there's a way of um, completing that circle, if you like. So I wanted to work on a circle. And I usually work on squares primarily because squares don't dictate the painting. A rectangle does because it automatically says landscapes. So you're always fighting against that. Squares don't. They can, they can, you're allowed to do that with it. And circles do the same thing. It doesn't dictate the outcome of the work. So these also went to use with us in the back of the car and a big box of paints. Um, and I created these ones. So these are 44 centimetres diameter, I think. I don't know. It's about that size. Um, and there's another two. So there were five of these. And they're on board. They're just painted on board. And they're <coughs> velcro onto the wall. Now this one, this is when I came back and I thought, well, I'm going to start to then just paint onto canvas that's been stretched onto embroidery hoops. So I've started to do that. So this has got some stitching in it as well. Um, and it's funnier because the tighter I get with the drawing and the pounds pieces, the freer I get with the painting. And um, a not so wise lecturer once said one sort of jewel of a moment in one tutorial when I was at art school. He said nothing else for four years, but he did say, if you want your work to change, just change your process, change the way you work for a while, change the medium, change the material. And he's completely right, and I've, I've, I've held to that actually in the head of, if you want things to change, change how you do it and, and move around it and then come back to it and see how it informs it. So it, it's an interesting thing that I do this tight stuff and I do this loose stuff, and the more I do that, the more that happens to that. And that's really interesting for me because it means that I'm, there's two streams, Maybe it's a Piscean thing, but there's two streams of me happening all the time, which I'm less concerned about now. That used to worry me. I used to think, but it looks like I'm doing different things. It looks like I'm all over the place. Actually, it isn't that there's a real reason for it all, and it's all tied in together. So this here, Miss Helen, um, this is Helen Angel Priest in the front row here, and um, she very kindly had written to me after the meth and to say that she'd really, really enjoyed the show and, and did we fancy getting together to make some work together. There was lots of parallels in what we did, although she's primarily three-dimensional in the way that she's making the work and isn't a painter in that sense, and I don't make things, but, but she had seen a certain way that I had created the show at the meth and, and had drawn the exhibition and placed things very carefully. She completely got that. She should write all my statements all the time because she completely knows it. So um, I thought it'd be interesting to show you what we were working on. We've, we've, we've put some stuff together for a proposal, really, for an exhibition. And I thought it'd be interesting to show you how I then think, well, how am I going to take that now? And what happens next? Because you're always thinking, well, how, could, how could I do? What's the next thing? Because your mind's never, ever at rest. I think, well, mine isn't. Um, so again, those of you know, we know these are not my digital skills. These are entirely Helen's digital skills. But you can see my work, and it's the whole idea that these little works leading you around an exhibition, leading you through it and up and under with, with Helen's sort of sculptural pieces, and playing with scale, altering scale, and altering how things might work. And with the stitch pieces, they then become part of these little sort of points of interest and the way you manoeuvre around. And they're just in the studio just now, but that's the, that's the kind of general concept that's coming around that. And this is a big one. I've started to make work that's not then tied to the canvas. It's going to maybe come down from the wall and sweep across. Again, it's going like that as soon as I do that. And it's very interesting. It's this complete counterpoint all the time. Um, and they're slotted in there. Who knows what's going to happen with them next. But it's a really interesting little thing that's going on between Helen and I and how we make the work. And again, that's when we were talking, Cully, about how you couldn't believe that I was involved in all these things and most of it's not for money, SSA is not for money, but I think what you get from it, you get this incredible richness of dialogue with other people, not just because you're put together to do a collaborative project, but because it happens quite organically and it's interesting and that discussion, and it's not about money, it's not about anything other than, than the need to do something. Again, it's the scratch and the itch, you think that could be good, let's, let's explore that. So we'll see what comes of that. This is one of the big paintings that was in the Methan Arch. I've not shown it there. But we've scaled it right up, and it becomes this big environmental um, wall, if you like. So we'll see if we can actually realise. I have to repaint it one and do it now. So with that in mind, I then started to think about how I could then stretch the work my own canvas says. So I started to um, tie it between one bit of the studio, like big hammocks. I'm not going to say banana hammock, but I really want to say banana hammock. <laughs> I had to say it, I got it out there. <laughs> but these are just big swathes of calico, actually. Not stretched, they're not in anything. It's just quite raw, it's quite up there. Um, but now, now that I've been making the wee dots, 
I'm making bigger dots and the bigger dots are happening through circles that are discs that I'm now cutting out so I'm making a bigger hole through something. So underneath there in the back there's a bigger piece that's just circles that are being drawn with a scoosher. <laughs> a bit like that. So they're drawn that way um, so it's quite an arbitrary uncontrollable mark that you make and there's another layer of muslin comes up on top of that and then you're drawing out circles from that and you're cutting that out. And then there's another layer that's going to go on top of that. And I'm just going to keep layering it, layering it, layering it until you can't see. So the other layers underneath are obliterated. That's the palimpsest. That's exactly what it is. They're scratched clean from behind that. That's what happens to them. So that's what I'm playing with. And there's my hands. Um, because it is, a, it is a very immersive process that I go through when I work in and work like that. And I think it's good to show you that it is. I do get covered in it. So... This is a very foggy image, but I just really like it. And outside our cottage in North Uist, there's this road sign that always makes me laugh in the morning because it just seems to sum up most of the time what's in my head, not really knowing what direction I'm doing that all the time. So rather than me thinking, that's a bad thing, actually, that's a really good thing because it means I get to do all these lovely, wonderful things and don't have to then worry about, oh, I should just be, it's not a linear thing. Artists are not linear. So why would I force myself down that particular route? So I'm trying to embrace the tangent. <laughs> um, but I love that image. So what's happening next? What am I going to do next? These, you might recognise them from colour from before. I have a show in Bratislava with another artist, Lena Namari, in, I don't know, <laughs> about 20 minutes, it feels like, in about a month. Um, and part of that is transferring work over there. How's that going to work over there? Because before they had my stitch works hanging on silk, now I have to find another way to exhibit that and how's that going to work over there. Um, and I've come back to the Perspex. So what's happened with these is these are currently being printed onto Perspex. So I've gone from painting to Perspex and I'm taking an image that's a reproduction that I've appropriated for myself, created something else with it, then photographed it again and then manipulated it again and then it's going to be printed again. So it's come full circle, so it's come from print and it's now going to be printed again. Um, onto Perspex discs about that, that size-ish. Um, there's six of these, so they're going to be black and white. Um, let's try and get something for Le Lena's a printmaker. Um, and it's so that, because my work's very bright, it's very colourful, Lena's is not. And I'm always saying this, but if I, I'm really hard to hang next to, so my work starts to look a bit like Ethel Merman. You know, next to Enya, it doesn't work. So you've got to find some gentle <laughs> compromise in the middle. So I'm going for the black and white with these particular images. There's Mr. Bulgaria that got that stolen, but that, it's a really powerful image, that little black and white image, so it should look really, really nice on the ever mortalised is the unique selling point in Bulgaria. Um, that's the very first one, if you remember, before. And these start to have a completely different quality about them. And that's the last one, I think. So we come to this. This is Lena's um, book. As a printmaker, she makes artist books, so she goes through the lithography process and photogravure and various different photographic litho stuff. I don't get it because I'm not a printmaker. Um, but she gave me one of her artist proofs. So I've started to do a bit of a pounds job on the artist proofs, but I'm working through it and from behind too as well. So it's got a, a puncture mark that goes through it to the back, but a puncture mark from the back the front now is a slightly different surface that you get on it now. I've got a notion if I, can, if I could teach myself Braille to do it in Braille then you could have words into it, wouldn't I? Mean, anyway, see I'm off on another tangent. But I'm following Lena's work now, so it's not just about following an image that I've taken, it's something that they're working together with another artist and see what I can do with her work and see how it changes what she does. So these are just in progress for the moment, there's two of these. Um, but the light coming through that is lovely, if you can imagine. I mean, I've got fantasies about LEDs and all sorts of wonderful stuff. Um, so that's, that's what's happening with those. And there's a little bit here, and I'll come back to that at the very end. And I think, I think, I don't know how long I've been talking for. Could be a week, could be five minutes. Don't really know. Um, but I hope that just gives you some sort of little insight into how certainly me as an artist how I make work how I come to a resolution how it's a continual going forward not really knowing why getting to a certain point and then taking some time to come back to it to understand why you've got to that point but sometimes you have to go around it and face the otter and the passing places and the big trucks um, and then come back to it before you can go back and keep going with it and that's what's been really interesting and and the SSA has done that for me as well, though I will, I will end that soon. Um, but it's, it's been lovely to do this, actually, both of you, because it's forced me to have to take stock 
which I think I don't often get to do and I don't often get to have that dialogue with myself about why I make work and what I do. I think you always feel slightly fraudulent. You always think, who'd want to know anything about that? Why would you want to know that? Um, and you, maybe you don't, maybe you're confirmed that you really don't want to know about it, but in my head, I've, I've come to understand what I'm doing a little bit more. So I think what you're doing is something really lovely around there, actually, and about how it's viewed, how it's seen. So thanks for giving me the chance to do it. Um, this little epilogue, as a mother, um, a lot of my time is spent trying to keep the kids busy while I make what I do. And it's not always easy and it's quite hard to be a parent when you've got children because a lot of your creative energy is kind of sucked one direction though, and you're always you know, in a quite a difficult place. But I have to say, today's Rudy's birthday. This is Rudy over here. And I just wanted to put a little candle for Rudy because it's his birthday. <laughs> so well done, Rudy. It's your birthday today. <laughs> So Rudy is nine, and actually I'm reminded with my children that I draw a lot of creative energy from that, although I might um, not always seem that way when I'm barking about shoes, because you know everything I do is a performance, really, down from the tiny mark to the big thing, and sometimes getting out of the house is a bit of a performance. I quite like that analogy. Um, but you know, I draw a lot from them and their innocence about things and their need to just be involved and make marks. Rudy got an art set today and he's sat fascinated all morning. It's a reminder about what a great thing it is to be an artist. So that's all I'm going to say. If you've got any questions, comments, whatever, Rudy's going to ask me if I like chocolate. <laughs> he's primed. <laughs> that would be yes, Rudy. So if anybody wants to know anything or is curious or you know, doesn't like it, that's okay as well. Um, fire away. Rudy. It's a good question. That, I never thought about that one. Do you know what? And the oh, he's good. Um, in when I was doing Killing Time, it was very dark, um, and in my set that I was in, it was really, 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 really dark. I couldn't always tell what colour I was using. <laughs> So you would tend to make the pinpricks and you would, you would hold it up because you, you couldn't always see. So I started to get really interested in the dots that I was making and I would hold it up to them. What was the one on the right hand side? It was a Beckett play on the right hand side and they had a big, giant, giant, large, large moon on the wall and I used to hold it up to the moon. <gasps> it's another circle, man. Um, and I really liked the light coming through that. So that's, that's a good question because why did I start doing that? But the, you naturally make the hole when you put the thread through, so you can't help but make that mark. But it's whether you don't focus on that or whether you think, oh, that's quite interesting. So that's, that's where that came from. Thanks, Rudy. Anybody else? Feel free. Just kind of practical level, how do you display the pieces, the printed Good question, Paula. Um, how am I going to display it? Well, I'm still waiting to have absolute confirmation that I can make a hole in the wall because that will be kind of um, prime fact in how I'm going to display it. But I have discovered these, um, you know, you can see it in Perspex signs and that people up there, little, um, they call them secret fixings and they sit proud from the wall and you put a hole through it and it fixes and it holds it in and you just screw it into the wall. I didn't want, I think it looks quite clunky, it's chunky and it's, it's not delicate enough for what I wanted to do. Um, but I also need them to sit out from the wall so you don't get that slight noirish effect that happens. If they're too close, you can't focus, you think your eyes are not working. Um, if they're flush against the wall, then you miss the point of them being on perspex because it's about 7 mil deep, so there's a bit of a depth going on with them. So I found these plug, and you just because they're quite small, there's just one plug, you don't have to screw a hole in it, you just let it, it just sits, it braces it into it, like a little vice, a bit like the wooden ones before, so there's some kind of follow through from that. That goes into the bottom, it just holds it at one point. So just with this dot on the bottom, so the wee circle at the bottom that holds it without having to put a hole through it. That's the plan. Could get to the back and say you're not screwing a hole in anywhere. In which case I'll, I don't know, well, there'll be a way, there'll be a way to do it. Um, but yeah, that's an issue and I think if you're an artist that works in any kind of contemporary um, material, that's always a problem because what works for one space isn't going to work for another space and how do you transfer it, how do you get in? So. Um, yeah, that's the plan anyway. I could use pins, but that's not going to work. Afterwards, because I'm not really interested in the gut, tell me about the pinch legs work because I know that it has to be light you up. Light you up, Perspex. You can, apparently, I was speaking to the guy at Forbes and he was saying that you can embed LEDs into Perspex. He does 
exactly how you like it. So you can start to draw. So that you can see that's the next stage is how to actually then not be dependent on the light, is that you create your own light so it's lit all the time. That'd be great. So I don't know, I don't know how that works. This is the problem also. If you're an artist that's a painter or a maker and you're in charge of making it, you can make it and you're in control of it. And you know what it does and what it, you know, but if you need to get something made on your behalf, you become like a project manager and, and that's the difference is how you then translate what you want. I went into Forbes and I just sounded so utterly stupid. Um, I go, I don't, I don't really know. Um, uh, I'm thinking maybe, <laughs> so it's not because I'm thick, it's because I'm trying to work out how that is in my head and I don't know the process, so I don't know what works and what doesn't work. So you're always a wee bit at the mercy of um, the technical aspect of it when you're getting stuff made and that's the world that I'm, I'm moving into more, I think. That makes sense? You didn't ask me a question, you just told me something really nice. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else got something to say? Volker. That's okay. Do I, am I happy with how textile art and abstract art is somehow married together or not married together? Is that what you're asking, Volker, that you're asking about how it's, how it's regarded, yeah, it's regarded, how it's yeah. regarded? I think it, it's a bit of a thorny issue sometimes, actually, and in the SSA um, submissions that we get are really broad, really varied. There's people coming from all angles about, about what they make and materials they make. There is a little bit that we always hold back on accepting tapestry work because we feel it has a different, it's an applied art and I think we don't deal with applied art. But in this current climate about how people use materials for different things, it's, it is a really difficult thing to do, I think. But I think the textile makers and the makers have many, many other outlets and I'm sure Carly would probably bear me out on that one. There's lots of outlets if you're a textile maker, designer, craftsperson, applied arts. Um, and I think, and if I put it into a fine art context, just shifts it ever so slightly. And sometimes you just know when it's not that, and sometimes you know when it's not that. There is Visual Art Scotland who, who do a lot of tapestry work, applied, applied printed textiles as well. We had a stoosh about a year and a half ago because one of the fine artists had submitted work that was a digital print on silk. And there was a real barney about that because people thought, that's not art, that, well that's not art, but that's not fine art, that's applied art. And she, but no, She's not coming at it from a textile point of view, so there will always be a really subjective argument about that, I think. Um, I don't see myself... We had this discussion, actually, with Owen and Cully when we'd mentioned the word craft in what I do, because there isn't a craft in what I do. I use a needle, and I use an embroidery hoop, but it isn't craft, it's different. Um, and it's not that there's an issue with that, it just isn't. And I, I think I'd be doing the craftspeople a disservice to say that I'm a craftsperson, I think. But I know what you mean, especially within uh, an abstract format as well, because it translates so well into textiles. It looks great. That's you know. like you think of textile artists, I just see that as a mixed media extension point of view. I see that, yeah, I quite naturally do that, yeah, I think so. But there is an issue, and I think a lot of people, there's a, a growing world of uh, artists and craftspeople that are doing that, and I think it's interesting to watch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there's a lot of people that are doing that, and I think it's interesting to watch that. And there's a lot of people that are doing that, and I think it's interesting to watch that. And it's interesting to watch that, and it's interesting to watch that. But it's a different psyche, I think, and it's different, just a different context with what you're putting into, and it certainly is when you put it in the public realm.